Peace, love, and coconut oil family. It's the young Caribbean god, Siam Ra. We're back at you once again with another video here in sunny St. Lucia, right? And we're basically going to give an overview of our first lecture, okay? So before we start off, I would like to say to our who went which means all praises to the divine consciousness, the source, the all, the essence, which resonates within the universe and within you and myself. So we are the gods and goddesses. There is no God outside of ourselves. Having said that, I would like to venerate our African ancestors, right? And also our diaspora ancestors, as well my direct family ancestors, namely my sister Lyra and my brother Fabian. I'd also like to big up and shout out every member of our Melanated Empire WhatsApp group. You're larger than a breadfruit, yeah? Talking on one like Zeke, Empress Veneta, Hope, Baby Kemet, you know, gonna have a first Melanated Empire baby soon. So give thanks for that, you know? And all active members talking about Claude, Quaid, Zeke, Slayer, you know, Kobe. All of y'all know yourselves, man. And last but not least, our subscribers and our viewers. We started small and we're growing big. Without you, it would not have been possible, and you give me the inspiration to continue. So, the struggle continues, and I do give thanks. Before I lay my premise, right, I would just like to start with a question. How really is it important, how important is it really, excuse me, to know the truth about anything? I mean, us here in St. Lucia, we love to party and we love to drink. I mean, we love the recreation activities. You know, it's like going on the beach and just chilling all on the weekend, and who isn't sipping from a cup is sipping from a spliff, you know? Put aside that, work has basically taken over our lives in so much that we give almost eight to 10 hours to our employer. When we come home, we hardly have time. We mostly knackered, we just drain from the long day of work. We don't even have time for family or even time for ourselves. And because we have that lackadaisical attitude, we tend to take the same approach to spirituality. So oftentimes we say, you know what, I'm already Christian or I'm already a Rasta, I'm just going to stay in it. All this new information that's coming out, I'm not really about that. But how are you going to ascend spiritually? How are you going to become your higher self? So this is what this new wave consciousness is about. This age of awakening. Yo, there's an awakening going on outside. We need to wake up. Okay, black people? And especially us here in the Caribbean. I mean, this information is being trickled. But we have the opportunity and the responsibility even you know, to go and seek this knowledge. I mean, when we were a child, we behaved and we thought and we even believed as a child. But now we're adults. I mean, we have to put away childish things and childish beliefs, okay? So we here at Melanesian Empire, as you can see right here, we concur with the black scholars, Dr. Ben, okay, Dr. Clark, when they say that, in a nutshell, no to religion. Because religion, according to them, has been, has, Religion's role in the demoralization and the destruction of melanated people and indigenous cultures was ruthless. And we say that with all religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Islam was the worst because they began from long before the European, from 640 AD. Okay, so this statement, I know it's a bit far-fetched, but we're going to explain ourselves as we go along with the presentation. All right. The premise we're going to lay down for this video is basically from a discussion I was having with a Christian brethren and something he said that stuck with me. He said, we all need something to believe in and he believes in the Bible and God. Okay. I replied to him that by him saying he believes in the Bible, he's also saying indirectly, giving a slight attestation that slavery was the greatest thing ever done to him. Bear with us and we'll explain. So the name of the lecture, the name of the video is the truth about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, slavery and Christianity are all responsible for the plight that black people are in today. We realize the role that religion plays within the first epitome of consciousness, whereas in a people who have no direction and being misled also um, okay, need some means of spirituality or some foundation to stand on. But that is just the first level of consciousness. And if any of these books were to be taken literally, it can be proven that there is no way possible that these things ever transpired historically as well. Having given the bedroom that reply, this is where we're going to go into because the first lecture was held roughly around emancipation. Emancipation deals with slavery and 
we're going to just tie in the Jesus Christ story. We're going to go down two roads. Secularly first, doing research historically to see whether he ever existed. And then comparing his story with earlier mythos to see where they correlate. And you can make the decision for yourselves if this individual really existed. So, by you saying you believe in the Bible, you believe slavery was the greatest thing ever done. And this is where we're going to begin. So family, we are continuing from what we left off from the intro. In that, if the guy says that he believes in the Bible, you are also giving a slight attestation that slavery was the best thing ever done to you as a black person. You know what I mean? Because it was during slavery that we were introduced to these books, namely the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran. Am I lying? Did black people know about Jesus Christ before slavery? No, they didn't. It was during slavery and the Crusades and the Inquisition, okay, that the Roman Catholic Church superimposed this religion upon indigenous people of many lands. The first lecture was actually held um, on Emancipation Day 2018, as we can see the title right here. So it begins with the Slave Trade Act of 1807 because we need to touch upon slavery. Many people say that you know, um, why you guys come and talk about slavery that has long passed and whatever, whatever, you know. So, we need to touch upon it basically to show that we are still showing behavioral patterns of post traumatic slave syndrome. Okay? And slavery abolished in the 1800s. That was just. I mean, some of us have grandmothers that are probably 97, 87, 97 years old. If they had their grandma, she probably passed away. So that would she, she would have been born in the 1800s. The 1800s slavery, when it, when it was abolished, that is just like two grandmothers ago. So it's not that very far a time off. Okay? So the Slave Trade Act passed by um, the Parliament of Britain in 1807 prohibited the transportation of slaves, right? It was okay to still have slaves, but you couldn't transport any slaves. But then in um, slavery, uh, the Abolition Act of, 13, of 1833 was not implemented in St. Lucia until the 1st of August, 1834. So while the act was passed in 1833, it was a whole year afterwards that we got um, our emancipation here in the Caribbean, in St. Lucia. Well, in St. Lucia specifically, because some Caribbean countries, namely Cuba, slavery went on for another 50 years and it was abolished in 1886. All right? St. Lucia now got its independence on the 22nd of February, 1979. But according to Dr. Henry Clark, that is just flag independence because to be independent would mean that you are emancipated and we are coming into the origin of the word, okay? Origin of the word emancipate, to free from restraint, control, or the power of another, especially to free from bondage, to release from paternal care and responsibility, to free from any controlling influence. Now, this presentation is a panoramic, detailed view, okay, of the first lecture. Points I didn't touch upon, I'm going to touch it upon here, okay? So I'm just going to give you just, just an all-inclusive um, detailed presentation. It's going to have some writing. Some of us don't like to read, so I'm going to read it out for you. All right? Getting back on topic. The origin of emancipate. So if we were truly independent, we would have been emancipated. So that would mean we would be completely free from restraint and control or the power of another. Or from the paternal care and responsibility. Dr. Henry Clark calls it, calls it flag independence because everything remained the same but the flag. Okay? So the whole parliament, the way of the system of running things, the economic structure, it all remained the same. I mean, look on the money in St. Lucia, the Eastern Caribbean dollar, you will see the queen's head. Okay? And even on the coin, I mean, you will see the queen's head and when you turn to the back, you will see the slave ships. Alright? So, nothing has changed. Even the way they run the whole parliament structure is the same as Britain. And according to St. Lucia's history, we were seven times British 
colonialized seven times rich and seven times French. The last colonializer being that of Britain. Okay, so they would be the ones to give us our independence, which um, the whole act was actually run through by one John Compton. To emancipate, we as a nation in St. Lucia, in the Caribbean, we are not truly emancipated. It appears that way, okay, because everything has remained the same but the flag. Now, while we were released from restraint and the control of power of another, which is slavery, we were, the shackles were released physically, but the mental enslavement that was done upon black people or done upon us has remained. I mean, take for example, when, when you send a soldier, all those guys who go into war in Iraq that the US sent into war, after years of killing, they, they can't just come home and just merge back into society. Some of them need to go and undergo some serious counseling. That is because they are entering a completely different environment that killing is not the order of the day. So when black people were released from all these years of brutality, centuries of brutality and genocide, we had no one to counsel us, to teach us back to ourselves where we were actually taken away from, teach us our roots, our ancestral lineage, no one to teach us anything. So we lost our language, lost um, our spirituality and basically lost knowledge of ourselves. And we were just led back into the wild. As a result of having no economic structure, no financial stability, when slavery was abolished, most of the slaves had to go back to the same slave masters to the, on the plantations. That is because, okay, like I said, we had no financial stability. Then now, it, um, a period of time passed where it was referred to as indentured servitude. So we were not brutalized as we were before but we still worked for the slave master and paid very little the same as is done today i mean in the system those who are working would know what i'm talking about we can't even really say most of us live from paycheck to paycheck from salary to salary right so it's basically the same thing we're not given our worth okay and as a result we still didn't get back in tune with that spiritual concept of our ancestors if one knows the famous reggae artist of the Caribbean, Jamaica, namely one Bob Marley. His famous quote was, emancipate yourself from mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our minds. A lot of individuals had already waken up to the fact that our spiritual concept was stolen from us. Not just that we were taken away and physically brutalized, but our spiritual concept and our relationship with the, with the divine, with divinity. Mental slavery meant that we were still under the oppressor's subjugation, his way of thinking, his spiritual concept, if he has any, or his religious concept, I should say, which we had to break away from. Slavery in itself still left us with some scars mentally in that there, are, there, are some, there is this disorder referred to as post-traumatic slave syndrome. Even all the hatred amongst the brothers going on, even on the street today in St. Lucia. You know, we're putting aside gang warfare, you know, and Owen and all that there. We're just putting that aside. We're talking about just basically just walking down the street and looking at each other and two brothers passing along each other. Because of what, of how one is dressed and his attire and his demeanor, the other one would have this notion of a little probably jealousy and hatred towards him. That stems from the slavery time period. It is said that even Willie Lynch, which is a fictional figure, but the letters that he wrote, we can see that those exercises were actually put to the test. So one of them were, if you put one slave on the field, make one of them work on the field, and one work in the house. The one on the field, seeing that the one in the house is basically inside and is in warmth, and the one on the field is working in cold and has to work very hard. The one on the field will start to hate his brother, seeing that he has it probably easier than him. These behaviorisms stem from slavery. We didn't just get these things. That's not even black people. We are people of love, especially down in St. Lucia. Oh man. Our neighbors here and the people are so, I mean, they like to mind each other business for sure, you know. But in times of need, true neighbors and the true St. Lucians, you can go and if you're missing sugar, if you're missing rice, anything, you can just go and just ask your neighbor 
and feel no way about it. And the neighbor will even, most times for sure, give you more than you need. These behaviorisms, they are not of us. So it all stems from mental slavery. So the ancestors' famous quote among many of the temples was, Man, know thyself. So slavery is not too far off. And we have not fully recovered psychologically from the effects of that time period. So in it being emancipation, we're just going to touch upon the time periods of slavery. The first of them being um, the Trans-Saharan and Indian Ocean slave trade. So we have the race and periods of slavery of African peoples. I really don't like to say slave trade because it gives the impression that slaves were actually taken from Africa and brought to wherever. Slaves wasn't taken from Africa. People, scholars, scientists, astrologers, okay, were taken from Africa and forced into slavery and became slaves. So the first period of slavery is the Trans-Saharan and Indian Ocean slave trade, which was you, you waiting for it? Which was done and purported by the Arabs. So the Arabs or Islam is responsible for the first period of slavery of African people. This time period and this figure right here, I'm just being lenient for my brothers and sisters in Islam. But the truth, you can still see the truth on the future slides because one of the pics actually gives you the time period and gives you the figure. But I'm just being lenient because the number, the figure is absurd. Even up to a day like today, just last year in 2018, Muslims were still taking black people as slaves in Libya. So slavery in Islam or slavery by the Arabs who are Islamic people have been going on since 640 AD. And we can see here through the diagram the very big arrows are more where the concentrated slaves, okay, and the small arrows. So we can see the transportation of slaves mainly to the Saudi Arabia region, Yemen and Oman. Moving along, we can see pictures here of slaves about the Arab ships, and we can see the Arabs right here. You can see them by their clothing, actually standing to take the picture of our ancestors, brothers and sisters. The Arabic word for slave is Abid. Okay? And that would actually also say, you know, it also means to be a slave of Islam. But the word Abid is also the same word for black in Arabic. So the same word for slave, Abid, is the same word for black. So they are already calling black people slave in the language. So this language and this culture can never be for or of black people. They took the concept of Islam from Africa. Let's get that correct, the concept, okay? But Islam is not our culture. This down here is a 19th century engraving of Arab slave trading caravan across the Sahara. You can see the, the Muslims right here, and you can see the slaves with the yokes on their hands, okay? Arabic slave trade continuing. This picture right here, I mean, it might not be too clear, but this is just a man lying on the ground, they're dead. This guy here moaning, this guy just in bed in last, last breaths, and that's them just leaving. So after they've assassinated the village, they left. An Arab slave raid in East Africa in 1888. Okay? 1888. Slavery was abolished in 1834. The death toll from 14 centuries of the Muslim slave trade in Africa is estimated at over 112 million. I had on the previous slide um, 50 million. 112 million here we could see the arabs conversing with the caucasians with the europeans right here you can see them right here and the slaves right here this is a slave market so they're here actually beating and you know this guy here inspecting the slaves right so these women right now are former islamic state captives meaning these women aren't islamic Islamic wasn't their religion. They were captured. These women, she was probably a nurse, she was probably a, a, a scholar, she probably managed some business, you know, and she was probably still schooling. These women, all right, were captured from Africa, 
okay, and brought to Saudi Arabia. Now, something I forgot to mention, there is a huge difference between the Trans-Saharan slave trade and the Transatlantic slave trade. Yes, the difference, yes, the major difference is the Trans-Saharan was done by the Arabic people, okay, the Arabs. But for the Arabic slave trade, for every man they took as a slave, they took two women. And for the transatlantic slave trade, for every two men, they took one woman. Alright? So that tells us, and it's also been documented, that the Arabic slave trade was more of a sex slave trade, where they abuse and defile our women. This is how we know this religion and these people do not respect the black woman and they do not venerate women on a whole. It is also in their religion. We're going to break that down in future lectures. All right. So these women were Africans taken from Africa in slavery and brought to Arabia. And as a result, being captive, you have to practice your captor's religion, which is what is happening to us in St. Lucia, which is why many of us are into Christianity, which is also why even though we say we oppress and we go against the Christian religion, in some way, shape or form, we are still in an underlying, and when I'm saying that, I'm referring to Rastas, we are still taken upon the notion that that Bible and the story of the Bible is historical and legitimate. And as a result, taking it onto ourselves, okay, what we were oppressing at one period of time, we have somehow assimilated it into our, our divinity story. Okay, so these women, again, taken from Africa, brought to Arabia, Saudi Arabia, and as a result, being oppressed, they have to practice their oppressor's religion, which is why all of them are now Muslim women. So one might see these people and say, oh, we can see Muslim, black, black Muslims, you know, different times and, really? Are you being serious? I just told you that Muslims were actually enslaving black people from 640 AD. The concept of Islam was taken from Africa. I mean, we're going to go into Islam. We're going to break it down as well. Okay? But that's, that's not the topic. I'm just stressing and making a point that if you are enslaved, you need to practice the enslaver's religion, which is what is happening to these women here, which is also what is happening to us in St. Lucia. The next one is the recent period of African peoples, Portuguese and Spanish slave trade. This would have not been possible if it was not for Pope Eugenius IV, who wrote a papal bull stating that African people are three-fifths of a human being. We do not have a soul. So as a result, we were now labeled as pagans, and then the Portuguese, Spanish, and the English had and saw the opportunity to come and enslave us and exact their religion upon us. So basically to them, we do not know God, because look, we're here trying to give... Um, attributes or definitions of God using animal heads and stuff so we pagan and animalistic and they need to come and show us Jesus Christ although they learned from us those early Greeks and those early Europeans they learned from us and then right now I have the audacity to redress the information given to them and come and send it back to us enslaving and killing many in the name of that same God okay but we're gonna think we're going to get into this. So the Portuguese and Spanish slave trade, the time period between the 14th and 15th century, okay, and estimated um, the estimated number is 8 million. We can see the slave routes right here, also going to the Caribbean, Charlton, Venezuela, Ecuador, and the rest. We have a lot of artist depictions for some reason. We don't have a lot of um, actual camera views, okay? So here we can see the building up of slaves right here, these guys standing here, counting up the slaves. And here, Africans mine and wash gold and deliver it to Spanish overseer. A system soon developed where about 90,000 enslaved Africans were sent to Spanish America as early as the 1600s. And then this brings us to the most recent period of slavery, which actually includes us. Now, while I say includes us, many might disagree with that notion saying that they are aboriginal and indigenous to this land. That is for another topic, but for this I would just like to say yes, there were people here before Columbus and those slave ships came here, 
right? But these islands are submarine volcanoes and have only been there for a certain time period. And then we, our ancestors as Africans, sailed those waters long before these individuals. So yes, they were Aboriginal people, and yes, slaves did come in. So we presently are a mixture of the Aboriginal or Indigenous people of St. Lucia that was here before those slaves came here, intermingled and integrated with those slaves brought from Africa. This goes. Moving along. So the transatlantic um, enslavement trade, time period 15th to 19th century, the 19th century, because you can see that in Cuba in continuing until 1886, that's almost the that's almost the 19th century, and indentured servitude also continued in Cuba up until past the 19th century period. Estimated number again going very lenient with the numbers. Many scholars will prove that number very incorrect, and it's probably multiplied by three or four. And many can see the slave trade routes. We are very familiar with this. This was probably taught in school. This is actually where black people know most of the history begins from, or actually starts from. These here are contraptions that basically they use to subjugate us. This here is a form of the Wailing Syndrome where this individual is whipping his brother while the overseer looks, while his wife also looks, and his brother looking at him being whipped. This guy is beginning to hit this guy. This guy has no option because if he doesn't do it, this guy is going to kill him and him. She right now is being demoralized because she's seeing her king being stripped naked and beaten, right? She now will not put her trust and faith and strength in him or look up to her or look up to him as her king. And this is all in the psychological warfare that we experience during slavery while this cracker just stands here and looks with his wife and child as well. Look at this right here. Look, I didn't even see this. Look at this here. Okay? So we can see the indoctrination done to us. But something we often overlook during this time period of slavery, it was when we were introduced to these churches and to religion. Many people say, but yeah, we had a religion in Africa just before you know slavery. And most people really, especially people in the churches, don't know the history before slavery. They don't know anything of Africa before slavery right religion and churches were introduced on these slave plantations the word church comes from the scottish word kirk which comes from the roman goddess named Circe, which goes back to mother Circe in the greek mythos okay mother Circe used to um, entice people and lure them into her lair and devour them and feed upon them all right now if your third eye is open and you are tapping into that higher consciousness you will see this is exactly what is being done to black people inside of these institutions inside of these places monetarily physically and spiritually plantation church by noel by noel leo erskine you can see here slaves in the church image same image that we're gonna get into moving along because of that time period of slavery, post-traumatic slave syndrome, I mentioned it earlier, there is also a next syndrome called Stockholm Syndrome. These are basically diseases that we exhibit. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is a psychological condition where a captive develops after years of torture by the capturer, where after all hope is lost, they cope with their rape and captivity by actually falling in love with protecting and even worshipping the capturer okay rapist slash rapist the syndrome or the disease or the or the dysfunction that happens within the brain is that this guy is torturing me so much especially in an abusive relationship if you have a, a relationship where this guy is constantly beating his woman beating his woman beating his woman one of two things gonna work one of three things gonna go she can either die for one she can get fed up and leave or she's gonna cower and submit like when you beat a dog and the dog knows that it's his master so whenever the, the dog whenever the master comes around the dog is just gonna cower and just wait for the master see if the master is just not gonna beat it so it's just gonna behave itself this is how a woman can behave and this is how many of us behave in the fact that we are now submitting and worshiping our capturer's image all right this is right there is a classical example look at the look on her face look at the silly look on her face all for this 
Caucasian image of Jesus Christ. Many of us should know who this is. I freed a thousand slaves, I could have freed a thousand more if only they knew they were slaves. I'm sorry? You do not know you were slave? Marinate on that for a minute. We're going to get into the lecture because it's basically the truth about Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? Which is really the core of this lecture. All right? Many people from different races approach this question and this individual on different levels. First of all, you can see the different nations within those. Are all these are the different images of the Jesus Christ. Caucasian image. Black Asian, I guess. This is the image the Hebrew Israelites carry. He's black, but his hair is still pulling. Right? This is the Rasta image with the locks right here. This is Isa. This is how this is an artist's depiction of how he would look if he was Arabic. In all of this, this Jesus character still did some, according to them, allegedly, some historical things. So many see him as a son of God. Now a lot of people, they have to embrace this doctrine because it was superimposed upon the world by the Roman Catholic Church. It doesn't matter how you digest him, but you just need to digest him. I'm saying this because some individuals will see him as the Son of God, and they're okay with that. All right? Some individuals can't see him as the Son of God. To them, God had no son. To them, he's a prophet. He's a rabbi. Oftentimes, you know when you have this box of chocolate? And you got the chocolate right there with the caramel inside. This one here is a bit crunchy. This one here has the drops of almond on the top. Oftentimes we approach this Jesus story like we're picking a box of chocolate. This guy might say, you know what, I like the creamy inside, I'm going to take it. So this right here, the, the creamy one, Jesus being the son of, the son of God. This next dude will come and he'll be like, I don't like the creamy inside. Jesus was just a prophet. I'm going to take this one. So that one's crunchy. Oftentimes we approach this question like it's a box of chocolates. So pick one, any, which image more resonates with you? Mind you, images of Jesus didn't begin to be distributed until the Council of Trullo, where they wrote a few canons, basically so showing um, corrections to be done to the Bible. Within one of these corrections, Canon 82 to be specific, he says that the image of the savior of the will will no longer be a lamb it will now be a man on a cross look it up do your research moving along i mean i'm not gonna pick anyone you guys can pick one right so we're just gonna go these are the different images no one really knows and truly what he looks like so who is this jesus christ individual straight from wikipedia put it straight from there so you guys can go online do your research it's right there from AD 30 to 33 BC, also referred to as Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus Christ, was a first century Jewish figure and religious leader and is the central figure of Christianity. Most Christians believe him to be the incarnation of God and the awaited Messiah prophesied in the Masoretic Old Testament. Alright? Jesus in different languages. In Arabic, Jesus is referred to as Isa or Yasu. In French, he is called Jesus or Jésus. Eh? Part one. Jésus, Jésus, that's what this Jésus is saying. In Greek, he is called Iosus. In Hebrew, he is called Yahushua. Portuguese and Spanish, right? Portuguese and Spanish. He is known as Jesus. And in English, obviously, which is English, which is what we translate all of this from into different languages, as Jesus. So don't let anyone tell you that Isa or Ayosos or Yahushua is somebody different from Jesus. It is just this Jesus Christ in a different language. We need to understand that point. We need to get that point. Moving along. How did we find out about Jesus? Now, I just had to touch upon the slavery time period because as I said again, the lecture was done on emancipation and the slavery time period is responsible for exacting the oppressor's religion and belief system upon us. It's BS. When I say BS, you can translate it as bullshit but it actually means belief system. Okay? As well, the subtitle of the lecture is The Truth About Jesus Christ. So we are going down first the secular rule 
to find out about this individual. So first we go on Wikipedia, who are you, how did we find out about you, and where we actually found out about you, where did that come from? So we fill and go in. How did we find out about him? The origins of the Holy Bible. It was said that six elders from the 12 tribes of Israel wrote what is referred to as the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. Okay, it includes the Torah, which is the five books of Moses. For time is the second librarian, his name is Silas, requested that requested to Ptolemy that he have a translation of the Hebrew text in his library. All right? So they translated the text, and the first translation of the text from Hebrew to Greek was known as the Septuagint. From the Septuagint, we have the translation from Greek to Latin, which would give us the Venus Latina, will give us the Codex Sinaiticus, and would also give us the Latin Vulgate. And then it got revised, as I was saying, in, th in 382 AD to the Latin Vulgate. This is what Codex Sinaiticus looks like, Septuagint, Codex Alexandrius, Codex Irifamai. Now, the Septuagint in its entirety has a lot of pages missing, okay, and we can see it's actually quite distorted through the passage of time. But the Codex Sinaiticus is the oldest, oldest version of the Bible put together from the translation of Hebrew. Mind you, there is no evidence, okay, of the original gospel in Hebrew. There is no evidence of the existence of the original, the original canonical gospel, and there is no evidence of those books even being written by the people names that are put there. No evidence whatsoever. I'm not talking out my ass here. Alright? So if Codex Sinaiticus is the oldest put together version of the Bible, we would have to question the Ethiopian Bible, don't we? The Ethiopian Bible is the oldest illustrated version of the Bible. It is not the oldest Bible. The oldest illustrated version means there are a lot of pretty pictures in there. Biblical texts. Apparently, for some reason, a lot of us here in the Caribbean, including Rastafarians, hold to the notion that the King James Version of the Bible is the most holiest Bible out of all of them. You know, it's probably... You know, since it was actually written in 1601, that it's the oldest one and, you know, the new versions and the new English versions and new international versions we have presently are basically changing all the words, you know, changing everything. So we have to stick to the King James version of the Bible. Really? Really? Remember, these texts were copied and plagiarized and given back to us in a European construct. So we need to bypass, go to the root, then we could really understand those texts and see where they inserted different information which would establish their idea that slavery was a divine feat granted to them by God. So King James, and also I would like to touch upon, many Hebrew Israelites are also saying that King James was a black man. King James was the king of England in 1611. In 1611, slavery was still going on. As we just saw in the previous slide, the first slavery trade act was in 1807. Slavery is still going on. You really feel a black guy is going to be the king of England? Really? And the church, and there is also the Church of England. The Church of England, which was, which was established by Henry VIII, in the notion that basically he just didn't want to follow laws from Rome, from Italy. So he established his own church, which is the Church of England. Alright? And then this individual, who also wrote a book called Demonology, wrote what he called the Holy Bible. And he is also a Freemason and a homosexual and a mass murderer. Please do your research. So this book, which we think is so holy, was authorized by a homosexual and a Freemason. Okay? These books are highly coded. Freemasonry is a high science institution, you can call it. This book is heavily coded. Don't think it is holy in the sense of the word holy. From this one book, which is supposed to be the one inherent word of God, no errors whatsoever, and I can point out so many contradictions, all right? We have different religions from that same one Bible. Look at these individuals. Don't they look like slave masters to you? Or slave masters' children? Hmm? John Smith created the Baptist religion in 1608. 
Charles Barham created Pentecostal in 1901, Joseph Smith, Mormons in 1830, Charles Taze Russell, Jehovah's Witness in 1872, William Miller, Seventh-day Adventist. Origin of the word religion derives from Latin religare, which means to bind, to tie back. So religion is not beneficial to us. And I, when I say that, I mean all religions. Dr. Ben said, religion is the defecation of a people's culture. Dr. Henry Clark also said in his book, Christopher Columbus and the period of um, African slavery, the role of religions in the demolition and destruction of African and indigenous civilizations was ruthless. And, I, and he says so with no exception, including Islam. These religions, whichever one you want to pick, because most of us are associated with one of these, if not Catholicism. All these religions, different understandings, which are supposed to be from the same one Bible. So, historical evidence of Jesus. So we've left the Bible. The Bible is where we actually found out about Jesus. All right? But the Bible is just one book in itself. It's a religious book. If this individual really existed, we need to go into history to see whether there were any scholars, writers who documented this individual. The proposed time for Jesus' ex for Jesus' existence around 1 AD is said to be one of the best documented times in history, in Roman history. All right. So we're going down the secular road. We need to prove this man's existence because I mean I used to write so hard on this. And coming across and studying and and blueprinting this knowledge within my cerebral cortex you know i know for a fact that this individual i mean you're gonna make your decision by the end of this so historical evidence of jesus the historicity of jesus have been accredited to two historians all right publicist cornelius tacitus who mentions christus in his annals okay not, not his annals his annals meaning his, his book, some documents that he wrote. And Flavius Josephus, in his Antiquities of the Jews, Journal of Early Christian Studies. Within all the scholars and writers of the first century AD, and you're going to see the list with the numbers, right? With all of them. Only two individuals wrote about this guy who apparently fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread, resurrected in front of many, died on the cross in front of many, only two. So let's keep it moving. Tacitus the historian, senator and historian born in 56 AD, part of the Roman Empire. His excerpt on quote from sight in the annals of Tacitus. Hence, to suppress the rumor, he falsely charged with the guilt and punished Christians who were hated for their enormities. Christus, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius, but the pernicious superstition repressed for a time broke out again, not only through Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find a center and become popular. So this guy, as a historian, he wrote this in one of his books, just this paragraph. And most Christians for thousands of years has used this to justify Jesus Christ existed. But the thing about it is, this was investigated upon, and it turns out that Tacitus, Cornelius, this individual, had a gay lover referred to as Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger was the Christian, one of the early Christians who wanted to exact this form of mental slavery on the people, which was formulated by the kingdom of ideas, which is Rome. Tacitus and his gay lover, Pliny the Younger, who was a Christian, coerced him to include this passage in his writings. Tacitus sent his works to Pliny for criticism, and he himself begged for the product of Pliny's pen. I don't know what pen is, pen, gay lover, I don't know what pen, right? And Tacitus also turned to Pliny for first-hand material for his histories, so he was not hesitant to use Pliny as a source. So it was Pliny, it was found that it was Pliny, okay, who actually said this piece that Tacitus included in his annals. What? <laughs> that actually. <laughs> right? In his annals. Okay? 
So there is no way that we can trust this as a as a credible source. I mean, this guy checked his gay lover for his work to stick in his anus, right? And I mean that both literally and figuratively. I mean, just when I was doing the research, just the fact that only two historians spoke about this individual and just a paragraph, I questioned the whole thing right there. And then going down deeper into the research, we can see that this first um, paragraph or this first entry or supposed evidence of Jesus' existence was plagiarized. As well, they used Josephus. Now, the Josephus proof has been used for many years. There was also proof of, of um, the cross. There was a cross. There was proof of the, the nails that they allegedly um, nailed Jesus with. The, the church used all of these for many years, even the Josephus alleged passage. It says here, Josephus born in 37 um, CE, BCE, the native of Judea. He is a Jewish historian. Now, there was about this, this is what he says, okay, in his antiquities. Now, there was about this time, Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, the teacher of such men as received truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousands all the wonderful things concerning him and the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day. So this sounds very convincing, right? I mean, you would see that the historian after the wrote this would be like, wow, so this guy really existed. But he was a Jewish historian. Jew Jewish people do not support, they do not subscribe, no assent to the idea that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They just see him as just a rabbi. So that's the first red flag right there. But then, while this guy existed in the first century AD, in the fourth century AD, while doing a research on his work, it was shown that his work as well have been plagiarized. This time by an early Christian bishop named Eusebius. Bible scholars have discovered that the few sentences mentioning Jesus are a blatant Christian forgery that does not appear until the beginning of the 4th century. Even Earl Daltrey declares, Now, it is a curious fact that the older generations of scholars had no trouble dismissing this entire passage as a Christian construction. For example, in his Jesus um, calls it a pure Christian forgery, that is Charles Unibert. Before him, Ladner, Hacker, and Scherer, whatever his name is, all these are top scholars and writers, along with others, declared it entirely spurious. So that has to be dismissed right there because it was inserted by Eusebius, who was an early Christian father who wanted to push the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. All right? So the two means of evidence or historical evidence we were supposed to have of this Jesus character has turned up wanting. As you can see here, this is the list of first century writers. We're talking about scholars, historians, the lot. All right? Philo of Alexandria, Sirius Italicus, Val Valerius Maximus, and the list go on. Not a word about Jesus. You mean to tell me out of all these guys, only two of you wrote about him? And all of them lived at the time it is said that Jesus existed? Don't you find that highly questionable? Don't you find something fishy with that? Right. There was this episode where Ernie and Bert was in a boat and basically went fishing. Bert had his fishing line and hook and everything and he was there for quite a while trying to get some fish. And Ernie's just there chilling and Bert's getting a bit frustrated and he's like, Ernie, the fish won't come, I ain't catching no fish. And Ernie said to him, but Bert, all you gotta do is call the fish. And Bert was like, what? Call the fish? And he's like, yeah, call the fish. So, thinking that Ernie was just a pull-off and Ernie was just being silly, but teased him and be like, Ernie, call the fish, let me see. So Ernie goes, takes a deep breath, and he's like, yeah, fishy, 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 fishy. Bloop. And you just see one fish just jump into the boat. <laughs> you should see the look on Bert's face. So I'm just using this basically to say, if you want to catch the fish, just these two fish. Mind you, it was two fish that Jesus fed the 5,000 people with. Two fish and five loaves. So if you want to call the fish, you just got to call them out. Right? 
with a little research. So family, as we just saw in the presentation, the fraudulent emancipation and also how slavery is undeniably tied in with religion. We also went down the secular road and showed that there is zero evidence for Jesus Christ's existence. In part two of the presentation, we're going to highlight the attributes which make this character Jesus Christ so special and compare it with other savior figures of earlier mythos before Christianity. And having brought those two information together, you guys can make the decision for yourself. We have already made ours, as you can see. So thanks for watching and thanks for being with us. And none but love for you. Peace, love, and of course some coconut oil.